can you can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our virtual lecture with our guest speaker, Professor Josh Galperin from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. It's a great pleasure to have you all here today. <clears throat> our program is founded um, by the European Commission in the frame of uh, the H 2020 program and the Marie Curie actions and our research covers a variety of topics related to energy law and climate policy. Uh, this series will um, also feature as a guest speaker on April 29, uh, Professor Uma Autka from the University of Kansas School of Law on an energy law uh, related uh, matter. Uh, for further information, please feel free to visit our website www.law that uh that edu slash inner center now i'm going to hand it over to our own professor tracy esther co-director of the center for carbon management in energy at the university of houston at the university of houston and our uh, chair this morning so tracy it's yours now Thank you, Alban, and good morning to everybody. It's a great pleasure to see everyone, even if only virtually. Uh, it's my pleasure to be the moderator for today and to uh, welcome our speaker, who is, is always a delight to hear, Josh Galperin. Uh, before I do, I also want to make sure I give a shout out to the other quadrant on my screen right now for Victor Flatt, uh, who is uh, also a fellow professor at the University of Houston Law Center and is the co-director of our Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource Center which is the logo behind both of our heads. Uh, in that regard, I'm hoping that uh, Victor will jump in with questions for our topic today as well. So my mission today is to introduce our speaker and then set up the topic and get out of the way. Uh, before I do so, just want to remind everyone that this is set up in a format where you can ask questions virtually, uh, including through the question and answer box. We will be monitoring those. Uh, please be sure to use those instead of the chat function, and that way we'll be able to curate them a little more effectively. And we'll also look for opportunities to make sure that we get everyone's questions in as best as we can. So with Actually, that- Tracy, I'm gonna sorry, interrupt Victor, you for one second. I think we forgot one thing. Um, I think we needed to show the CLE screen um, for those who are getting CLE credit at the beginning and also at the end. So just, uh, everybody, if you're getting CLE credit, um, this is for Texas, but you can also use it for your own, uh, you can file for attendance with us and for your own uh, jurisdiction. So we'll show it again at the end. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Now that's an incredibly important interruption. Although I suspect that by the end of the pandemic, we've all have accrued a lifetime supply of CLE online credits. Okay, well then, uh, while that code is up, why don't I go ahead and introduce Josh to everybody. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Josh Galperin to our speaker series this semester. Uh, he's on the faculty of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, having joined them in 2018. Prior to going to Pitt, uh, Josh was actually the director of the Environmental Protection Clinic at Yale Law School, and also as a lecturer at the Environmental Law and Policy Program Director at the Yale School of uh, Forestry and Environmental Studies. So uh, in that regard, he has uh, been a fixture at most of our workshops and presentations around the country dealing with environmental administrative law policy and his scholarship focuses in those areas. Uh, he's written extensively on environmental law, administrative law, food and agriculture, property, constitutional and tort law. Uh, before Yale, Josh was also at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy where he established and manages their, their coal plant retirement campaign uh, which uh, the fact that it's starting to sound anachronistic means that it was successful. Uh, he was also legislative counsel at the Bedford Vermont General Assembly and also went to Vermont Law School where he was on the editorial board for their law review. He also has a master's degree in environmental management from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, 
that's the bio. I'll just add a small personal comment, which is Josh is on that short list of scholars that whenever I see one of his articles pop up, I immediately download it without even reading the title because he's always writing on interesting and fascinating stuff. And it's always a pleasure to read. Uh, with that, his topic for today is uncommon law judging in the Anthropocene. And with that, Josh, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, and thanks for having me, everybody. And and Oban for, um, for organizing this whole thing, which I mentioned earlier is one of the most organized uh, event series that I've ever taken part in. So thank you guys very much. Um, that, that was a, a nice uh, long introduction, which I appreciate. Um, and Tracy specifically- Actually, okay, this is Victor interrupting yet again. I just wanted to make sure we get rid of the CLE thing now so that we can focus on you and your screen sharing. So there, there you go, great, thank you. So let's see, and I'll just share my screen now before I forget. I'm not going to get to it right away, but um, so I was—I was saying it's a nice. Um, uh oh, am I frozen? It should take a second. There we okay. go. There we go. Perfect. So I—I I was saying it's a. Um, it's a, it was a nice long introduction. And one of the things you said, which I get it, which depending on how you read it may or may not be true. You said I have written extensively on, and then you um, had a long list of things and I have written extensively, but not on all of the things on that list. Uh, torts is, is one of the things that I've only written a bit on. Um, and this, this is one of the few pieces I've, I've written in that subject area. So I'm actually sort of glad to have the opportunity to talk about this piece because common law is something I think a lot about. Uh, it's something that I have started writing about. It's something that I teach, but, th but it's a relatively new area of sort of my scholarly agenda. Um, and so just to give a little context before I dive into the, to the substance of the talk, as a scholar, one of the things I'm interested in is uh, sort of comparative institutional analysis. I want to understand the way that different legal institutions advance, uh, undermine, or just generally interact with public interest goals and public interest values. And so I use environmental law and to a lesser extent, food and agriculture law to sort of act as articulations of public interest values. And then I use doctrine in mostly administrative law, but also constitutional law and common law, property and tort to help sort of define, describe, compare and contrast the different institutions. So tort is sort of a, and common law in general, sort of a new injection in that agenda for me. And, and this is one of the first times I've had an opportunity to have an audience to talk about it. So I'm, I'm um, excited. And I, I hope this is a piece, this article that I'm talking about is a piece people will read and, and not just Tracy because it's short. Uh, so instead of the, you know, 25,000 word pieces I normally dump on my audiences, I think this one is maybe 8,000 words. So if you have an opportunity, take, take a look. Uh, in any case, the talk is called Uncommon, and the, and the chapter is called Uncommon Law, Judging in the Anthropocene. And the title is actually a bit misleading because, in fact, I want to talk about something that's very common. Uh, I want to talk about the, the essence of common law judging and what that legal institution means for environmental policy making, what it means in the Anthropocene in a world where the impacts of humanity on the physical world and the impacts of humanity on one another uh, are completely ubiquitous and unavoidable. So in short, what I wanna to argue today and what we try to argue in, in the chapter is that common law judges have a really important role to play in environmental protection. But I say protection here rather than perhaps policy because judges don't like making policy. Uh, and this is fair and it, and it seems it's fair that judges don't like making policy, and it seems to be a reason common law courts often dismiss environmental challenges. The reason that common law courts and, and critics think that judges, the reason that, excuse me, that reason is that common law courts and their critics just think that judges do not have an important role to play in environmental protection. There's this sense that environmental suits are trying to vindicate broad environmental rights. But really, common law judges need to recognize, and the critics need to recognize, the important role that the courts play in resolving individual disputes, individual disputes, even as those individual disputes are couched in debates over broader societal politics and broader societal values. So instead of making environmental policy, uh, the, the common law can be a source of satisfaction, a source of momentum, uh, of articulation, of democratic engagement. And in, in these ways, 
the common law can contribute to environmental governance without actually being policy making. So we, we've got this problem that you may have heard about, um, climate change. And, and in the US, especially, uh, but not exclusively, in the US, legislatures have responded too slowly, if at all, and Congress has not responded in any meaningful way. So rhetorically then, there's this argument that maybe we can turn to the courts for climate policy. And there are plenty of examples of climate change litigation in the common law, or at least in common law-like claims to, to, to the court. So we had um, Connecticut versus American Electric Power about a decade ago, right, in which Connecticut and some other plaintiffs sued greenhouse gas emitters under the common law theory of public nuisance. We've got the Juliana case, which was just in the news earlier this week, and I'll, I'll touch on that briefly at the, at the end of the talk, but the Juliana case in which youth sued the federal government for failing to plan for climate change under, and the suit is brought under a public trust theory. Technically, it's a constitutional claim, not a common law claim, but it, it effectively has all the trappings of the common law, so it, it works, I think, for this analysis. And then we have these newish suits coming from municipalities across the U.S. against oil and gas companies using negligence and nuisance theories to try to get at the greenhouse gas emissions of, of, of the defendants. So what I really want to focus on is what these suits are actually about what a common law approach to climate change really means. So a few minutes, or minutes, seconds, it's hard to keep track of time. A moment ago, I said that these suits are, are rhetorically an alternative to public policy. To the, to the, they're an alternative because legislatures are failing, right? They're an alternative, they are an alternative to fill the gaps that legislators, legislatures have left. But the argument I wanna make here is that in fact, the common law is not an alternative to regulatory approaches. The common law instead influences policy. It feeds policy, but it's not an institution for policy making. And in that way, the common law is not a fallback when legislatures fail. It's not an alternative to policy making. Instead, legislative policy making and adjudicatory dispute resolution coexist in a larger governance ecosystem. And we therefore need to evaluate each institution adjudicatory dispute resolution, resolution and, and policy making of different kinds, we should evaluate these institutions within their own niches in that ecosystem on their own criteria. So with that, let me try to give an outline for, for what I want to cover. That was a long introduction, but let me try to give you an outline for what I want to cover um, for the remainder of the talk. So the first thing I want to talk about, and I guess if you can't see this, you know, please yell at me and I'll, I'll try to um, fix the positioning. But the first thing I want to talk about is um, the common law, the common law as public law. Sort of the, 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 the framework that we tend to operate in today, because a lot of scholars have evaluated the common law as a public law device, as an alternative to regulation. Now, I think this is the wrong approach, which is sort of the point of this talk. But since this is a common approach, I want to spend a, a moment running through this evaluation of the common law as public law. The next thing I want to talk about is, you know, whether we're talking about public or private law when we're talking about the common law. And, and so I'll explain the debate over the public or private nature of the common law. I'll explain the debate a little and then try to argue that we really should focus on, on the private role of the common law courts. Third thing I'll do is uh, try to describe sort of, or, or do the same evaluation, but as but the, of the common law as private law. So in other words, what I, I hope I will have made the case that we should evaluate the common law as a private law pool, and therefore we'll give a different evaluation with different criteria, um, third. And then fourth, I, you know, I'll, I'll conclude, uh, if there's time, I may try to talk a little bit about private law um, private law as, as a form of democratic government governance. Or maybe I'll leave that for Q&A, we'll see. Um, but the idea would be to think through the role that the common law, even as a private institution, can play in public democratic governance. So here's where the story begins as we, as we sort of jump into this first piece here. For a long time, we have believed, or at least talked and written about the common law um, 
as a way, as the only way um, to resolve environmental problems. This is sort of the historical story, the mythology of environmental policymaking. So we're looking at the past now, right? In the past, we believed that the common law, and in fact, the common law was the only way to resolve environmental problems because legislatures just weren't addressing these issues. But the story goes, the common law was ill-suited for the scope and complexity of environmental problems. Luckily, as the story continues, legislation emerged, right? Now we're in sort of like, that was all of history up until like the 1960s. Now we're in the 1960s and legislation has emerged to address environmental problems and the um, clunky, inefficient, inexpert common law courts, uh, they can do what they're good at. They can resolve small disputes rather than trying to create environmental policy. So that's sort of the story of common law environmental protection overlap up until the age of statutes in which, uh, you know, arguably we're actually not in the age of statutes anymore, but at least the age of statutes that emerged in the late 60s, early 1970s. Now, part of this story, this origin story of environmental law, part of it is certainly true. The common law is definitely not ideal for public environmental policy. And I will talk about that. Another part of this story is wrong, or at least it, it begs a question. It assumes that the common law is supposed to be good at public policy. When we tell the story where the common law fails to be a successful tool for environmental protection, we are assuming or begging the question about the in purpose of the common law. And so I think that's a really important, important assumption that we have to get at and is what I'm trying to do in this research. So for the moment, I'm gonna skip over that assumption that the common law should be good at public policy. And instead, as I promised, I wanna address this first issue of how does the common law and tort in particular is really where I'm focusing here. How does the common law, tort in particular, how does it fare when we evaluate it as a public policy tool? So, um, you know, as I say, this is, the, this is sort of really the, the first, the first goal here. So the common law does not fare that well, uh, as many scholars have noted, it does not fare that well as an environmental protection tool. For instance, we've got a bunch of, a bunch of, of, of shortcomings. One shortcoming is timeline. The environmental harms usually occur slowly and over the long term, but the common law is retrospective and it is best at addressing clear past harms. So an environmental harm may not emerge until years after the causal act. And the full extent of that harm may not manifest until years after any litigation. So the timeline of environmental problems does not mesh well with the timeline of the common law process. Another issue we have is the complexity of environmental problems. Environmental causation in particular is really complicated, but a plaintiff has the burden to prove causation in, say, a torts claim. So you may have many possible defendants, many greenhouse gas emitters, for example. So many defendants that might be contributing to climate change. Then you have many different industrial activities, different types of industrial activities that may contribute to water pollution. And, and this sort of complexity, the multiple defendants, the different the pathways from emission to harm, this can make it hard for a plaintiff to identify a single defendant or even a small group of defendants and therefore make it hard to prove uh, the connection between some wrongful act and any harm that may occur. So the complexity of environmental problems also a real issue here. We also have a, a problem of expertise. Environmental causation, again, is complicated and judges aren't scientists. So it's hard often to link environmental harm to specific wrongful acts. It's hard to trace, say, groundwater discharges to drinking water pollution and judges and juries have no political or particular expertise in assessing this sort of hydraulic connection, nor do most plaintiffs. So the expertise issue here is a definite problem. Incentives pose another problem. Many environmental harms have primarily public damages, things like rising seas, heightened costs for infrastructure maintenance. But the common law usually provides individual remedies. And there's little incentive then for a private plaintiff to bring suit for a relatively small individual damage 
even if there are very large secondary community or societal damages and very large secondary community or societal benefits because the individual only has a small piece in that. So the incentives of the common law process uh, of the common law system are misaligned with many environmental harms. And types of harm, the types of harm at issue here are also important. And something that the common law and the environment don't necessarily overlap on very well. So the common law addresses primarily physical property and financial harms. And arguably you could say it only addresses financial harms or almost only addresses financial harms, but at best we're talking about physical property and financial harms. Environmental degradation, I think we can all agree, includes usually physical property and financial harms, but often it goes beyond this framework. And it can include, at least to some, at least to some individuals and some thinkers, the harm from environmental um, degradation includes sort of non-anthropocentric, non-transactional losses. So for some plaintiffs and some environmentalists, the need to define, the need arguably to constrain environmental wrongs in these transactional terms is, is, is a problem. It's a diminution of what protecting the environment really means. And, and that can be a real issue for some plaintiffs. The uh, next issue is the deterrence capacity. The deterrence capacity of the common law. Common law damage awards, um, they simply may not sufficiently defer um, environmental damages. And, and the, and the negative environmental behavior that they're meant to, defer, to deter. So one argument, which I'm going to return to again shortly, but one argument is that the public policy benefit of common law claims is that the common law claims, that the damage awards, when aggregated, they can send market signals. And these market signals are an efficient deterrent to certain, certain types of environmentally damaging behaviors. But the realities of commerce may undermine deterrence for a bunch of reasons. For example, uh, insurance, right? Insurance protects defendants from paying the full amount of almost any damage award. So they won't necessarily be deterred at the level of the common law award. The inability to, um, the inability of potential defendants to actually estimate the potential harm of their own behaviors, uh, um, not, able, not being able to calculate their own risk, um, based on aggregated common law damage awards, this can be a real problem for sending deterrence signals, even if the deterrence signals do fit. Um, the li limited liability-based structure of many corporate common law defendants insulates the actual decision makers from any personal liability, which then also dulls any potential deterrent uh, possibilities here. And, and then lastly, the ad hoc nature of the common law um, is sort of an obvious problem. The common law system cannot offer a unified or universal solution to widespread environmental problems because everything in the common law system happens on a case by case post hoc basis, which of course is very different from legislation. So, okay, the common law system, when we evaluate it as public law, the common law system is not a great fit for environmental policymaking. I told you that would happen. So why do we even do this analysis? Why is there so much scholarship on this point about the role of common law as an environmental tool? Why do, we, why do we ask about the role of common law courts in addressing major environmental problems? Why do we do that when it just seems so patently to be ineffective? And that brings us to the next part of the talk. Um, why are we thinking about the common law as a public policy tool? Now, one answer here might be purely practical. If legislatures don't do anything, if legislatures are failing to make environmental policy, then common law courts might be our only option because these environmental problems are existential and we really need to address them. And so we just turn to a perhaps slightly more accessible form of governance if we can't get into legislatures. Sure, that does make some sense and I, and I don't doubt that that is part of the reason, but it can't be the whole reason. It can't be totally a total explanation for why we, we want environment, excuse me, why we want the common law to be an environmental protection tool. 
why we want to evaluate the common law as public policy. It can't be the full explanation because the need to act, um, the, the, well, how do I want to say this? It can't be the, the whole answer because in fact, we started asking this question about whether the uh, whether common law is a good environmental policy protection tool. We started asking that question just when legislatures were the most active on various um, types of, of uh, environmental regulation and legislation you know, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. In fact, the conversation about common law tort as a policy tool are arguably a response to active legislation uh, from those who worried about the inefficiencies of the regulatory system. So you know, as Richard Epstein uh, has written uh, on this very subject, he, he says that environmental lawmaking through the legislature is a form of quote, special pleading for environmental uh, protection. And for some commentators, the, this emergence of environmental law in the 1970s, this was a problem because it elevated environmental law in a way that just didn't seem sensible. Whereas the common law process just sort of filters personal harms through the, through the courts without any a special attention to the environmental medium through which those private harms uh, emerged. So let's, let's, you know, I'm not sure that was totally articulate. So let me try to look at this uh, a little more closely. Um, um, so, and again, we're, you know, we're here thinking about why are we, why are we doing this analysis uh, and, and how do we decide whether to look at the common law as a public or a private tool? So broadly speaking, there are two overarching ways to view the sort of the purpose of the common law. And again, I'm mainly talking about tort in, in particular here. So these two ways basically turn on whether we see the common law as a private or a public tool, a pi private or a public institution. So um, the public policy view says that the common law is a public, public ordering device. The common law is a public ordering device where individual damage awards send deterrent signals and shape private behavior in order to maximize social welfare. This is, as I said, a public policy view, but we often, you know, often describe this as the law and economics view. Um, the law and economics view where the, the purpose of the decision making is to maximize social welfare, regardless of the problem at, that we're talking about, regardless of, whether, regardless of whether it is traffic safety or environmental issues or civil rights. Uh, it's a matter of maximizing social welfare. Now, this view emerged in the late 1960s, just as I, as I said, uh, arguably in response to major risk regulation statutes that were coming from Congress. So law and economic scholars argue, argued and argue in part that common law tools are just more efficient and a more precise way to regulate risk. Now, statutes have a number of flaws in, in this law and economics line of thinking. Um, one of these flaws is that statutes necessarily, as I hinted at, they necessarily elevate the issues that they're addressing, traffic safety, civil rights, environmental protection, food safety, what have you. They elevate these issues, sort of branding them as more important than competing interests. While the common law could strive for neutral welfare maximization without being forced to give special solicitude to any given public interest or any given value. And I think this is what Epstein meant when he said special pleading, elevating these issues beyond just their role in welfare maximization. Now, for what it's worth, you know, to my mind, efficiency, welfare maximization, these, these actually are particular social values. They're not, you know, they're more general perhaps than environmental protection or food safety. Um, they're less, they're less specific, but I don't, I don't, I personally don't see how they have some meaningful claim to neutrality as if they exist regardless of cultural norms, uh, but environmental protection somehow uh, doesn't exist uh, in a neutral space the way welfare maximization does, but that, that's um, perhaps a philosophical debate for another time. So the alternative view, the, the, the private view 
is that the common law is a private institution. And if it has any impact on public policy, that impact is merely a secondary consequence. It's not the, the essence of common law. That, that again is the private law view of the common law. And although the public policy view, the law and economics view has dominated for almost a half a century, this private law view probably looks more like you know, what you learned in 1L torts or uh, how you might expect to actually litigate a, a, you know, a common law claim. Um, it, it's been around longer, even though perhaps it's not been dominant for the past half century. And the private law view says that the common law is a way to remedy an individual's injuries when those injuries result from the wrongdoing of another. Now, there are sort of two major theories, arguably more, but two major theories under this private law view. To, th to some theorists, the core of remedying private harm is through compensation. So where a defendant's wrongful act harms the plaintiff, the defendant must compensate the plaintiff and, and make the plaintiff whole. And this is the, um, this is the corrective justice approach. Corrective justice. The idea is that the compensation corrects the wrongdoing. To other theorists, the core of remedying a private wrong is the process of empowering the injured party by creating, through the common law system, by creating an official forum in which the injured plaintiff can hold the wrongful actor to account, making the wrongdoer answer for their wrongful behavior, no matter how stark the power difference between the actors, between the plaintiff and the defendant. And this is usually called the civic, uh, the civic recourse approach. Both corrective justice and civic recourse explanations of the common law are, are firmly rooted in the idea of private dispute resolution, as opposed to the public goal of welfare maximization. Now we can argue, I guess, about which of these, you know, which of these general schemes of, of thinking is uh, is normatively best. Um, though I think it, it is plain that the private law view, the private law view has a certainly a sort of a longer history for what for what that's worth. The point here is that when we talk about the common law as an alternative to public policy, we do that. We do that evaluation despite the regularly negative light in which it shows the common law, we do that analysis uh, because law and economics, economics gave us the idea that both common law and legislation are public policy instruments aiming for the same goal of welfare maximization, and we need to evaluate them on the same criteria. And, and again, the core argument that I want to make is that I think that's a mistake. I think we should not evaluate them on the same criteria because common law is a private law institution and legislation is a public law institution. Maybe I'm bootstrapping by making that distinction, but, but I think it is a useful distinction because we have to have ways of identifying uh, and comparing and contrasting different types of institutions. And certainly the common law process and the public law legislative process are different institutions. So when we make this simple distinction between public and private law, and when we think about what that distinction actually means, rather than just sort of using those words, we can develop distinctive criteria for evaluating each institution. And then we can better decide the actual pros and cons of using common law approaches to address Anthropocene problems. Likewise, when we make this distinction, we can also free judges. And I think this is in, in one way, the, the most important takeaway, we can free judges from thinking that they must defer to legislative judgments. We can re-empower common law judges to engage in the private law aspects of environmental disputes. And so that brings us to the next, and what I think I will probably make the last part of the talk, which is evaluating the common law as a private law institution. And, and by the way, I should probably pause here and just say something else about the terminology very quickly. So I've, I've actually written about the public-private distinction elsewhere and why I actually think the public-private distinction is overdrawn when it is offered as a fundamental rule for governing. So I want to be clear that what I mean when I, when, what I, mean when I use the words public and private in, in this context today, I do not mean public as in government. 
and therefore private as in non-governmental. I do not mean public as in open to aggressive intervention and private as in regulated and governed only by markets and not governments. In this context, I simply mean private, private law to denote processes for individual dispute resolution backed by or intermediated by courts. And by public law, I mean affirmative actions of government to address issues of widespread concern. So I, I wanna be somewhat clear what I'm, what I'm trying to get at with those distinctions. And, and maybe that helps a little bit with the possibility that my whole thinking here is, is just bootstrapping. Now, returning to the main issue, what are the proper criteria for evaluating the common law as a private law institution? As my co-author on this piece and, uh, and former colleague, um, Doug Kaiser once wrote, the common law is quote, a private forum for the airing of grievances, the declaration of norms and the redress of wrongs. And so I think with that ideal in mind, we should look at the common law and ask whether the common, whether, whether a given common law claim seeks to um, do, a, do a couple of things. Whether one, the common law claim seeks to create accountability. Uh, two, we need to ask whether the common law claim seeks to establish norms of responsibility. Norms, uh, you know, I would say establish norms, but particularly establish norms of responsibility for social interaction. And third, we need to ask whether a common law claim seeks to remedy specific wrongs. Using this criteria, what we're, what we're not doing, we're not asking what can courts do to solve climate change. Instead, using this criteria, what we're asking is, has the defendant wrongfully harmed the plaintiff in a way that a court can at least partially remedy? And so I wanna do a sort of a little case study here, and I'm, I really wanna be careful about not wading too, too deeply into this, um, but you know, I, I want to think a little bit about the Juliana case. And the reason is, uh, you know, one, the Ninth Circuit recently denied the on bank review of the panel decision in Juliana. And since the Juliana team just was it yesterday or the day before, re revealed their plans for moving forward, I thought that might make a, a useful, if brief, case study. And again, I am aware that this is, the Juliana is technically a constitutional claim not a common law claim, but I think, the, I think the, the structure here is nevertheless sufficiently parallel. So for those who are not familiar, very generally, th this case, Juliana, claimed that the young plaintiffs suffered a variety of harms from the impacts of climate change, uh, and that the federal government had caused these harms in its failure to address climate change, and that this failure of the federal government was wrongful because the government has a duty under the public trust doctrine to steward the atmosphere for future generations. Now, importantly, the plaintiffs requested declaratory relief to settle the question of whether there is a right to a stable climate, and they requested injunctive relief, forcing the government to develop a plan to address climate change. So what was a few months ago now, I guess, was more than a few months ago, maybe, the Ninth Circuit dismissed the case on <laughs> time, right? I mean, time these days is like impossible to track. So. It could have been this morning. I really don't remember. Um, but I think it was a, a, maybe a little more than a few months ago. And the Ninth Circuit dismissed the case on standing grounds, having found that the plaintiffs had proven injuries and that the federal government's inaction on climate change had caused these injuries or likely caused these injuries. Um, the court still held that there was no standing because the, the court itself had no ability to provide a sufficient remedy. And, and they held as follows, quote, the central issue before us is whether an Article III court can provide the plaintiffs the redress they seek, an order requiring the government to develop a plan to phase out fossil fuel emissions and draw down excess atmospheric CO2. The court continues, reluctantly, we conclude that such relief is beyond our constitutional power. Rather, the plaintiff's impressive case for redress must be presented to the political branches of government. But why, right? The plaintiffs haven't asked the court to define the terms of policy, 
They have not asked the court to shape the substance or technological strategies. They have not asked the court to mandate a certain strategy for greenhouse gas reductions or even that specific industries should be primarily targeted in any federal plan. All that the plaintiffs asked is that the court decide what the law is. Does the right to a stable climate exist? Is there an atmospheric public trust? And to make the government develop a plan if there is such a right. And courts have mandated, of course, many things from you know, defensive driving um, courses or drug treatments to school desegregation. So uh, it's not as if courts have never ordered specific government action, specific actions before. As Judge Aiken said in her lower court opinion, so Judge Aiken is the is the district court trial court judge. Um, she said that courts have broad power to fashion remedies. The power is not unlimited, and the court would need to as she said, quote, exercise great care, but there's no reason the court could not, in the minimum, issue declaratory relief. And, um, and, and that, of course, I guess I'll come to that in a second, but that is, of course, exactly what the plaintiffs have decided to, 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 um, to, uh, to adjust their complaint and, and aim for. So now, I honestly don't know if I'm right or wrong here in my analysis of the Juliana case, because I'm, I'm frankly not one of the closest followers of Juliana. I, I actually like sometimes to pick case studies that I'm less familiar with because I have fewer preconceived notions. And if you hammer me for that in the Q&A, I will fully understand and I will be contrite. Um, but let me let me say that again, that just this Tuesday, it was reported that the Juliana plaintiffs, rather than seeking cert from the Supreme Court where they'll almost certainly lose, um, that instead they're gonna seek permission to amend their complaint so that they can focus only on declaratory relief rather than injunctive relief. Basically asking the court, I, I, we presume they will ask the court to declare that there is a constitutional uh, right to a stable, a stable climate. And while I think the injunctive relief in this case that they asked for, as I just said, I think the injun ju injunctive request uh, to have the government make a plan does fall well short of what we might call judicial policy making or legislating from the bench. The plaintiffs move here to focus just on the declaratory relief. It does suggest they're thinking about this in, in somewhat of the vein that I am proposing here, asking for narrower, narrower relief because it forces courts to focus on the particular legal claims of wrongdoing and accountability rather than the policy implications. In any case, the point here is that the Ninth Circuit refused to advance the case on the merits based on what is at base a self-deprecating assertion that courts just aren't the right venue to solve climate change. Only that isn't what the plaintiffs were urging. The, right? the court said, put this to the political branches, but the plaintiffs were not asking for a political solution. We, the, the, the court here is that courts should not look to the problem of climate change they should look to the problem of inaction. A court cannot order a perfect solution, but it can order certain kinds of actions. So judges shouldn't let the, the publicness, the vastness of the Anthropocene deter them from resolving cases that really do raise individualized and discrete claims of wrongdoing. Courts see the scope of these cases, the substantive nature, the existential nature of the problem, and they think that that means any resolution is automatically a public issue, a public policy issue. But the global problem is rarely the same as the narrow legal question and the narrow individual harm in a given case. A couple of examples, when there is a car accident, which is right the prototypical, I don't know if anybody else teaches torts, I teach torts, the car accident, I must use car accidents as a hypo four or five times in a class, plus on the final exam, right? The, the prototypical tort situation, a car accident, the plaintiff in, a, <coughs> in an automobile suit does not ask the court to resolve highway safety. And a court wouldn't say, we can't resolve this because highway safety is a po political public problem. When there's medical malpractice, the plaintiff doesn't ask the court to address medical training. When there's a slip and fall, when there's a slip and fall in Texas after an unexpected ice storm, the plaintiff does not ask the court to resolve climate change, even if she recognizes that climate change makes the ice-induced slips more likely, right? These are, these are the same kinds of individualized harms that we avoid elevating to public policy when we're talking about auto accidents, slip and falls, medical malpractice, 
But for some reason, when climate change is the subject, all of a sudden, all we can focus on is climate change rather than the individual harms that are at the core of the, of the common law claim. So basically what I'm saying here is that legislative deference in these cases, it's not a virtue. Judges should recognize that the scope of the subject is not the same as the scope of the legal claim. And so should plaintiffs. And maybe that's an important place to sort of frame or direct this lesson. If common law litigation is going to have secondary impacts on legislative public policy, then litigants are probably best advised to carefully tailor their claims so that those claims can get the public airing they deserve. Because even though common law litigation is not making public policy, it has deep and important ways that it can influence public policy by, again, creating notions of accountability, establishing norms of, of right and wrong, uh, and also, in the very most private sense, remedying specific wrongs. So these claims are important. These claims are important, and their resolution is important not just to the individual litigants, but also to generating public interest, public values, and public norms to help address climate change in the public sphere. But that doesn't make them public policy claims. So in short, to, to wrap up, the common law, it's not public law. We should be vigilant in reminding judges that they are not making public policy simply by resolving private disputes. Their resolution may articulate problems of the Anthropocene. They may critique failures of public policy. They may change norms and help us recognize sources of responsibility. And in that way, common, the common law absolutely influences public policy, but that doesn't make it public policy. And if we try to make it public policy, if we ask it to do too much, if we let judges believe their private rulings are public legislation, then we're probably not going to get anything done at all. And I guess that's a good place to end. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. That was a fabulous discussion. Uh, and I wanted to remind our audience that if you have questions that you'd like to ask Professor Galperin, please use the Q&A feature and we will make sure that we get the questions uh, organized and asked before our time runs out. Uh, in that regard, though, I, of, of course, uh, as the moderator, I, I'd like to exercise my small amount of privilege here and perhaps start the discussion with a question, but also would invite questions as well from professors Flat and Elvang. Uh, so I am curious in the way that you've structured the discussion with the whiteboard that the private function of common law uh, is serves different values in terms of uh, corrective justice and civic recourse. Having said that, uh, you, you suggest that one possible way to serve those functions is to have the court serve more of a role as a declaratory judgment sphere as opposed to actually wading into uh, some of the more problematic aspects of large scale relief that uh, call into question the role of the judiciary. So I, I guess to a certain extent, I, I, I was curious how far you would take that not only just with the Giuliana case, but also obviously there's a raft of you know, over 26 different public uh, uh, nuisance cases working their way through the court system. It sounds like there's value in your perspective then in the, the court simply saying that there's a, a duty, the duty has been breached, that the, um, there should be some redress, but leaving perhaps for a future proceeding or other uh, process actually figuring out how much and how to get it to the right people. Uh, because if I remember correctly, all the, the impediments to common law you had listed as it's a function of public law would seem to also perhaps make it problematic as far as a private resolution, because you still have to prove your injury, your causation, uh, the time differences, the scales. Uh, you, to a certain extent, does that sort of put the federal courts or the state courts in a position of basically issuing declaratory judgments, but having not really figured out how to turn them into effective recourse? That's a really terrific question. So to, to reiterate it, to make sure I'm understanding at least at least the core of it correctly, um, all of, I know you can't really see these anymore, but all of these, uh, let's see, you know, eight key problems that I mentioned for the common law as a public law tool, all of those could apply just as much, it looks like I went fuzzy here, but I can fix that, hold on a sec. Um, all of that can apply just as much to, to a private law claim, right? The problem is with the plaintiff making out the case. 
uh, not and, and proving you know and, and meeting their burden. Uh, the problem is not um, just the um, the ability to make public policy out of these individual cases, and that's that's absolutely right. So um, so there's no doubt that all of these things, the timeline issues, the the expertise and complexity issues, that that those things are going to be difficult for a common law plaintiff, whether they mean to make public policy or just to uh, sort of prosecute their own interests, right? However, um, that's th th this list is a mixed list. So things like the um, the uh, the incentive issue and the deterrence issue and the ad hoc issue, those disappear when we're talking about private law claims. So yes, th there will always be a a larger hurdle to making, not, not always, not every kind of environmental claim, but there will often be a, a larger, larger hurdle to get over when making an environmental common law claim than there will be for a much more traditional present slip and fall. Um, but it becomes easier if we can cut off some of these things from the list, such as deterrence, incentives, the ad hoc nature. The list is leaner and less daunting um, when we're when we're treating this, when we're cutting out the public law complaints, but that's actually a really good point. I hadn't thought about that 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 sort of lingering problem and how I've been articulating it. Yeah, it, it's particularly interesting in light of the Supreme Court's decision, the Uza Begnum case this week, which highlighted the the small amount needed to actually have Article Three standing. Uh, before I turn to the questions, which we're now getting some coming in, which is wonderful, I just wanted to check if any of our other panelists had a question for you before we turn to the Q and A. Um, actually, I, this is actually one of the Q&A questions, but I, I wanted to address it. So one of the Q&A questions says, is there any cost and benefit analysis at play when it comes to private law and environmental protection? And I wanted to start addressing that because um, that is an issue that um, I and a co-author, Richard Zerby from the University of Washington, wrote about in uh, common law nuisance suits and economic efficiency analysis. And my impression, and Josh, I don't know if this is what you found or not, is that at least if you look at sort of traditional common law for nuisance lawsuits, there's an indication, at least among many states, that um, economic efficiency is, a, is part of what can be considered in that. And, and one of the reasons you would allow nuisance lawsuits to go forward or not. Um, so do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, that, I, that's exactly right. So nuisance, like you said, Victor, not every state analyzes this exactly the, the same way. And, and, you know, I mean, I don't, of course, I have not done this, as you might have noted, this particular research is fairly theoretical. And in any case, I haven't done the survey, but yeah, I mean, that's sort of, um, you know, I, I have my, my torts uh, horn book up on, on my desk back here. The, the, the horn book answer is that reasonableness is a factor in, um, in, in, that, in nuisance, is the, is the interference with the property, enjoyment of property, is it a, a reasonable or unreasonable interference. And most courts inject the idea of cost benefit analysis into that reasonableness element. Um, and, you know, I mean, we can argue all day long. I have a definite opinion about whether that's a good decision or not. I think it isn't, but um, yeah, I mean, the cost benefit analysis actually has 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 um, moved its way into, into nuisance, which makes even this private law strategy look more like public law. I well, you know, although I would I would just note the one thing we did um, conclude in our paper is that um, allowing state common law nuisance climate suits to continue is efficient in all circumstances. <laughs> so so they should we should do it. <laughs> you said, I'm sorry, you said it's de it's good or deficient? It's efficient in deficient. all circumstances, meaning that if this to the extent this is a factor for states, it should always weigh for allowing the common law nuisance suits. Yeah, I think that's actually probably right because, you know, the the cost benefit analysis when it works its way into these these nuisance claims, what it works to do is sort of make us think in 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 the early environmental mindset, the pre climate change environmental mindset, like a uh, uh, um, uh, boomer, right? Um, uh, you know, we have a big new, uh, relatively new development that's bring, and employing lots of people and making lots of money, also causing, you know, what's not, not insignificant harm to people. And then all of a sudden we're pitting 
all of these identifiable costs and uh, against uh, benefits rather against less identifiable costs. What are the dirty car costs uh, or vibrations or lost sleep costs compared to what were the jobs? Five thousand jobs that they, you know were available were at stake in Boomer. So today, in a world of climate change in the Anthropocene. The, the ability to calculate costs for one has grown dramatically, but most importantly, the costs of climate change are, um, you know, I don't need to tell folks in Houston this, but the costs of climate change are much more apparent than many of the environmental costs that were, were sort of emerging back then. I don't, you know, let me be very cynical here for a second and say, perhaps there were some conservative judges who were con back in the olden days, who were concerned about the rise of environmental nuisance claims and thought that the cost-benefit analysis injection into reasonableness would be a way to tamp down those claims by forcing us to consider these economic costs as opposed to just worrying about the environment. Perhaps, but the sophistication and the size of the, of the scope of environmental problems has grown so dramatically that certainly that's been turned on its head. I, I think, you know, that's like uh, Ricky Revez would probably, uh, you know, that would be his, his claim, I think, here. Cost benefit analysis might have once been a tool that would hurt environmental protection. Now it is a tool that will help. And I think to some extent, I know uh, moral philosophy arguments notwithstanding, I think that's absolutely true. All right, well, uh, I think we have time maybe for one more substantive question and quick, got sorry. some great ones in the Q and A. Uh, one in particular I want to flag for you, which is this complementary nature that you this, you've analyzed in your chapter uh, between that sort of public function and private function tort law. One of the factors that complicates that is that the legislature actually is in a position to intervene and adjust the roles between those two functions. And one of the questioners has asked if you could talk a little bit about the interplay of the legislature in preserving causes of action, private causes of action, when they set public policy or preemptive. Yeah. I'll say two things. I'll try to be brief. So maybe we can even get a second question and uh, or whatever, an additional question. But yes, I mean, in most states, the private law is largely, uh, the common law is largely statutory now. Much of the process and the specific reasoning and specific elements remain common law-like. Courts have a lot of authority still, but there's a lot more legislative tort than there used to be. And that changes the nature of the process to some extent because it reduces the flexibility in, in, in sort of this list of the evaluative criteria for the private common law. But I, I don't, it doesn't make it public law because the, all the legislatures have done is shape the private dispute resolution forum, except to the extent that legislatures have cut out certain causes of action or created certain causes of action. So, um, you know, uh, uh, right to farm laws, which basically say you can't bring a nuisance suit against a farm um, for its stench or its or whatever, its pollution. Um, these are actually really injecting themselves into the substance of the common law in a way that m most of the statutorization of tort has not done. Um, excellent. Well then, uh, I'm gonna resist temptation unless Victor or Carbon, if you all have questions at this point, no, because uh, sadly it's 1058 and I'm worried if I ask you another question, we will definitely go to 1115. You know, uh, I'll time. Yeah. <laughs> I, although we'll say perhaps sometime you and I could have a cup of coffee because I'd be interested in what this model that you've outlined might mean for administrative law, where the two functions tend to be combined in certain types of formal rulemaking. Yeah. Uh, but with that, I, let me on behalf of our fellow panelists and for everyone in the audience, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And I'm unfortunately one of the functions, the features of Zoom is that you can't hear the rest of the rooms loud and ringing applause for you. Uh, although I did see one of our, our, our attendees did raise their hand virtually. So that's the closest you're gonna get. Uh, and with that, I'll turn the mic back to Victor and Alvin for anything you'd like to say about upcoming speakers in our series. Um, thank you. Uh, you can see the CLE information on there and Aubin announced our next speaker and I will leave the last word to him to do to that again. Uh, I think he's probably yeah, I, I, I was looking for my microphone.
There so the, the next speaker we have is uh, Professor Uma Houtka from the University of Kansas, and it will be on April 29. Thank you all so much. Um, we'll see you at our next uh, function. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank have a great you, spring break. Thank, Thank you. you.